Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming here today. And uh, thanks for the kind introduction and uh, for organizing this uh, uh, great uh, event. Uh, so my uh, contribution will be uh, about uh, sharing some thoughts about uh, uh, how hard it is in practice to solve some uh, problems. Physicists, chemists, uh, and uh, uh, other people care about uh, in, uh, when studying quantum uh, problems. So this is what I call the quantum frontier. And I will share uh, with you some uh, ideas that uh, uh, we and many other people uh, around the world have been developing in the, in the past uh, years. Um, and these strategies are, are based on machine learning approaches. And uh, as I will try to convince you, this can be used uh, to solve some, uh, approximately solve with good accuracy, some of these hard uh, quantum uh, problems. So, um, I guess, uh, like uh, all talks you will see today, uh, we will need to give you a short introduction about quantum mechanics, or at least our version of an introduction to quantum mechanics. So I will give you mine. So I hope you will not be, um, you know, bored. Uh, and uh, I will start my introduction with uh, the classical world. So my version of the classical world is a coin. Uh, I'm taking here two Swiss francs coin. Uh, I apologize if I didn't use pounds. Um, but uh, as you can see, uh, we have a thing in common. We also don't use euros, so you can see that uh, uh, we have this thing. So uh, in any case, in the classical world, if I have a coin sitting on a table, let's say here, you can immediately read the state or the status, the status of, the, of the coin, meaning that you can read whether the coin is sitting on, his, uh, uh, on this face or on this face, right? So you can see if it's two francs, so heads, let's say, and tails on the other side. So you can immediately tell whether the, the coin is on this side or on the other side. And in this sense, I will associate two states, if you want, to, the, to this classical coin. A state that I will, go, that I will call up, since where the, the, voice will, uh, the coin is facing uh, uh, with the two francs side up. Uh, otherwise, uh, if it's facing with this other uh, um, um, you know, uh, thing, I will call that uh, the down state of the coin. So everything is clear with a classical coin. You can always tell whether it's up or down, and things, as you've seen already in, uh, in, in the previous uh, uh, nice introduction, uh, become more interesting when you have a quantum coin. So here, there is my version of uh, um, an attempt at describing, if you want, uh, the principle of superposition that you've seen already in the, in the previous talk. But the idea is that a quantum coin can be, uh, at the same time, uh, in a superposition of being both up and down. Okay, so this is the, what I attempted to draw here. So half of the coin in this sense is up and half is down. And it's only by observing the coin, so if you want the classical observation and opening the box and having a look at this quantum coin, that will tell us whether the, the, the coin is sitting on its heads or, or on its tails. And uh, if we re repeat this experiment many times, you will get, in principle, if you have all of identical coins, you open the box and you read it, say, you will get many different outcomes, many different observations, and we say that the, 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 this quantum coin will collapse in its classical state. So it will be either up or down in this case, as you've seen also in the previous presentation. Now, um, how do we mathematically understand these, uh, these processes? Well, if we have a single quantum coin, up or down, described by these uh, two uh, possible possibilities, uh, mathematically, uh, as, also, as already, uh, for example, postulated by Max Born, so this, so this uh, person here uh, that you can see here, um, you need two numbers to describe essentially all the properties of this quantum coin. And we call these two numbers the quantum probability amplitudes. So specifically, if I want to describe all uh, the, the properties of this uh, up or down coin, I will need two numbers that I will call C up and C down. And as postulated by, by, by Max Borns and as it has been experimentally demonstrated many times uh, but now, uh, the square of these numbers actually will give you what is the probability of observing that your coin is either up or down. Okay? So if you want mathematically, if we have a single quantum coin, it's very easy to describe everything in principle. We only need these two numbers. And for example, their square will give us what is the probability of observing up or down when I open a box and I measure my, my system. Now, um, why do we care about 
quantum coins because there are in nature many interesting uh, phenomena, many interesting particles, electrons, protons, neutrons, who all are characterized by internal states uh, that we call states of spin uh, that are essentially equivalent to this image of a coin, quantum coin pointing either up or down and being able to be uh, at the same time up and down because of superposition. And for example, with electrons, we can even measure, so we can perform this operation of observing, if you want, uh, the electron spin by using, uh, for example, magnetic fields uh, and immersing these electrons in magnetic fields. We can measure whether the spin of the electron that we are actually looking at is either up or down. And we have very sophisticated techniques nowadays to measure the, the spin of uh, several of these systems. Now, uh, the f things become interesting, as uh, you, you, also see, you, you have also seen in the, in the previous talk, when we start putting together many of these quantum coins, so many of these spins uh, when we, we, we put them together. So for example, if I have two of these uh, spins, let's say these are two electrons and each of, each of the electrons can be in two internal states up or down, uh, in order to f characterize in theory all the properties of these two spin system, uh, I, I must be able to, uh, to know these four quantum amplitudes. Okay? So these are the amplitudes, for example, of, of observing the two spins up, or one up and one down, one, one down and one up, or both of them down. So you see that uh, by going from one uh, uh, spin, where I only needed two, one, uh, two amplitudes, and going to two spins, I have to double the number of amplitudes that are needed to describe, if you want, all the properties of this, uh, this, uh, this quantum uh, system. And uh, uh, things become even uh, more you know, demanding, uh, so to the level that uh, you have a sort of monster, when you have a system with many spins. So let's say that I, that I have now n of these uh, electron spins, so n of these uh, 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 quantum coins. So in principle, in this case, if you want to be able to describe fully in uh, its uh, uh, fullness the, the, the quantum system, you must be able to, to know uh, two to the power of n possible quantum amplitudes. So essentially, you must be able to predict all the possibilities of having, let's say, all spins up or one of them down and all the others up uh, and so on. So we have this uh, combinatorial explosion of possibilities that are needed to, uh, to, to, in principle, know about uh, the, the, the quantum system. And the, uh, we, we represent typically the properties of, of this quantum system with a vector that we call the quantum state vector or wave function. And essentially, the coefficients of these basis vectors are what we call the, the, uh, the quantum amplitudes that, that I was discussing before. Now, this object is so complicated and uh, exponentially demanding that there are, you know, uh, Actually, uh, people uh, such as Walter Kahn, who's a Nobel laureate in chemistry, who in 1998, during his, uh, his uh, uh, Nobel lecture, actually uh, stated uh, something quite interesting. So he said that the, the many electron wave functions, so the electron describing, uh, so the wave function describes the state of these many spins, if you want, uh, is so large and so complex that, in a sense, uh, is not even a legitimate scientific concept. Okay? So because of this exponential explosion of coefficients of amplitude that, that appear in this quantum wave function, there are some people, and I have to say this is a minority, in a sense, uh, view on the, on the fundamental uh, um, tenets of quantum mechanics, but th there is a view on the fact that it's not even possible that we need so much information, if you want, to describe uh, uh, a, a simple system, in a sense, of n quantum particles. So why this is complicated? Well, because, um, uh, the way I, I, I like to, to reason in terms of this exponential, if you want, complexity, is to think in terms of uh, storage equivalent. Or in other words, how much space so, uh, you would need to store the coefficients, so to store these numbers, C up, up, C down, down, etc., that corresponds to the quantum amplitudes that are needed to describe uh, in, a, uh, in, its, in a complete way a quantum system consisting of n uh, spins. So for example, if we go through the era of, of time and we go back to the ancient Egyptians, uh, they would have been able, if they cared to do so, uh, to write down uh, on uh, using their ancient technology uh, uh, a, certain number of a certain amount of numbers 
uh, that would correspond roughly to the number of, number of uh, so, so to what would be enough to describe the wave functions or what would be enough to describe the, the quantum magnitudes of a system consisting of roughly only 10 spins. Now, moving again uh, towards more recent times, in the 70s, uh, for example, we were already able to use digital storage. So, for example, uh, the, the first prototypes of hard drive. And here you could store much more information digitally. And uh, I, I estimated that, for example, in the 70s, you would have been able to store around uh, the, the wave function, let's say, so the, these are quantum amplitudes uh, for around only 23 spins. Okay? So this is what you can do nowadays on your laptop, for example. Uh, and now, if we move again on, uh, on to more recent times, uh, you see that by using uh, one of the largest uh, supercomputers available in the world, Summit, we will be able, by using all of its, uh, if you want, hard disk space, uh, to store the wave function coefficients for around 54 of these spins, 54 of these electrons, if you want. And you see, this is uh, maybe something that has been already quoted before, that uh, uh, if now I imagine and I continue this exponential progression, you can estimate that for uh, around 200 of these spins, uh, you will need uh, uh, as many atoms essentially as we have in the universe to store, just store, if you want, all these uh, uh, quantum amplitudes that correspond to all the states, possible states of my uh, quantum system. So you see that we have a problem in principle uh, if you want to study exactly the system because this exponential complexity at least on classical hardware, is really a strong limiting factor. And this, uh, this fact, uh, or in general, the, the idea that solving uh, the Schrodinger's equations, or solving the fundamental equations uh, that uh, appear in quantum mechanics uh, is hard, uh, was already known uh, to, the, you know, to, the, to, the, to the great uh, minds who started quantum mechanics. Um, and for example, I like to, to cite this, uh, this quote by Paul Dirac from 1929, so essentially, uh, already 100 years ago, almost, who said that uh, at, at this point in time, and this was already in, in uh, 1929, uh, all the underlying physical laws necessary for the mathematical theory of a large part of physics uh, and all of chemistry uh, are completely known. And he was referring to the fact that people had uh, understood that, that uh, uh, the sharing as equations, so these equations that I write here, for the wave function, so for this, un, for this vector that describes the, the, the quantum amplitudes of my system, was already discovered, uh, <clears throat> and uh, it was already applied and was found and experimentally verified. However, what, what he also was pointing out is that the equations that appeared, so for example, Schrodinger's equation, is too hard, <clears throat> is too much too complicated to be uh, soluble. So in practice, for example, we don't have uh, exact solutions to this equation for more than a few particles and numerically, as I showed you, if we even attempt at the storing the wave function, we would limit it to a very small number of particles, a very small number of uh, electrons. So it's clear that uh, we have a problem in the theoretical prediction of the properties of how the quantum world uh, behaves because of this uh, complexity in the, in the wave function, essentially. Now, um, how do we, do we go about that? Do we just stop and say, we cannot do that, uh, we, we cannot study quantum systems, we cannot make predictions? Well, as you can imagine, this is not the case, and uh, physicists, chemists, uh, computer scientists are very you know, um, uh, creative. Uh, and in the past, uh, uh, past decades, I would say in the past 30 years or so, people have invented several uh, uh, computational approaches that are extremely powerful at describing uh, these many spin systems, if you want, these many particle systems or many body systems, as uh, we, we used to call them. So one uh, main idea that, 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 that is, is, uh, is key in the field is uh, what is called the tensor networks approaches. I will not go into the details, but essentially the main intuition behind these kind of approaches is that uh, if I have uh, two chunks of matter, let's say I have n electrons here and n electrons there, if these two chunks of matter are uh, far enough, right, they really don't talk to each other. And in a sense, if I want to describe this combined system that consists of two n electrons, it is enough for me to represent the, the, the wave function, if you want, or the amplitudes of this system in a sort of independent way. And this idea can be made more systematic and can be used to exploit what we call low entanglement. So you've seen that in the previous uh, 
presentation that entanglement is a, is a key feature of quantum systems when you put them together, but you can also exploit the fact that in some relevant cases, there, is, there are situations where the entanglement, so the correlations in a sense between far apart chunk of matter is so small that it in a sense is not relevant and you can co control it in order also to describe the wave function and to describe the properties of the system in a more uh, accurate way. So this idea is extremely powerful and can be used especially in one dimensional systems. It gives rise to a representation known as Maddox product states that you can see here. Now, if you go to, uh, to, for example, also higher dimension, there is an idea that is due to, to Feynman. Uh, it was uh, his uh, PhD thesis. It's uh, a, a, a classical representation of quantum mechanics based on uh, what, uh, uh, what we call today Feynman's uh, path integral. Uh, and uh, in a nutshell, the idea is that you can think of uh, all these uh, uh, probability amplitudes um, as a sum over many distinct classical events. So for example, you can think that uh, your class, so as, as I showed before, that your, uh, your quantum particle can be in a superposition of up and down. And if I'm able on a classical computer to sum or to consider all these possible paths, so all these possibilities, all these exponential possibilities, by using, a, a, for example, a sampling approach, so a Monte Carlo approach, in some cases, you can describe also the properties of this uh, interacting system. So these are two key ideas. I will not, uh, you know, uh, dig too much into this, but I will just uh, want to flesh the fact that uh, in the past uh, 30 to 40 years, there's been a strong progress in the understanding of how we can simulate, if you want, these many-body quantum systems. Now, despite the, the, our best efforts and despite the development of uh, ideas from uh, quantum computing, uh, and uh, despite, uh, you know, again, the development of ideas such as quantum Monte Carlo or tensor networks, there is a large and uh, uh, unexplored land. So this is what uh, I call here terra incognita, you know, just to, uh, to, to, to show that uh, I am uh, of somehow of late in origin. So this is the, uh, the unknown land. Uh, and uh, you can see that in the, there is a large uh, amount of, uh, of quantum problems, if you want, of quantum phenomena. Uh, that we cannot uh, address either with quantum computing uh, or classical computing, uh, and uh, even in principle, I would say, with quantum computing. So it's not always the case that we can address all quantum pr problems or that we can make predictions in the quantum world using quantum computing. There are many fundamental problems, so for example, what we call ground state problems, so the problem of understanding what a material or what a, a molecule does at equilibrium that cannot be solved in a polynomial time by a quantum computer. And so for those uh, and for many other problems, we need to have uh, sometimes often an interplay of, this, of the best of our technologies uh, available. So, and uh, on the other hand, on the classical side, we have strong limitations from the techniques that I just showed you before. So for example, these tensor networks approaches are limited uh, by the fact that th there are interesting situations where you have strong entanglement. So it's not true that my two chunks of matter do not talk to each other, but they start you know, talking to each other and then these approaches break down. So this is especially true, for example, in two dimensions where we have this kind of problem emerging more prominently. And quantum Monte Carlo methods instead break when I cannot uh, uh, um, you know, fully uh, uh, go uh, towards this exploiting this analogy between classical and quantum mechanics. And there is something that is known as the same problem where uh, that essentially breaks all simulations based on Monte Carlo or sampling approaches. So what are we gonna do about that? Well, there are many techniques that are being de developed these days. I will just focus on uh, uh, what uh, uh, we've been doing what, and many other people have been doing in the field. And these ideas are based on, on machine learning. So why machine learning? Well, because, and this is, I think, a key observation, um, it's important to understand that uh, um, this uh, exponential monster that appears in the wave function is not only a prerogative of quantum mechanics, okay? So this exponential complexity is something that we see appearing naturally in many other phenomena, both human-made and, uh, if you want, made by, by nature. Um, and, uh, for example, if you look at the game of Go, where, as you know, there are two opponents and the goal is to capture the, the stones of each of the other uh, opponents, um, you can uh, you do, uh, do an estimate that uh, there are uh, about 10 to the power of 700 
possible games you can play in, uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this simple, I mean, on this finite, if you want, uh, uh, on this finite board. So this is a huge number. Um, and again, if you compare this to the, the number of atoms in the universe, you see that this is uh, uh, way larger than the, atoms, the number of atoms in the universe. So you see that this uh, exponential complexity that, for example, in this case, um, uh, pro, uh, for, for, I mean, uh, essentially, uh, does not allow you to, to, def to always devise a winning strategy because um, you, you are not able to go through all the possible games and then see this the, the, and uh, move according to the optimal strategy. This would be too costly because it would require essentially to go through all these possibilities. So you see that this exponential complexity appears also in other domains that have nothing to do with quantum mechanics. Okay, so let's, let, let's keep this in mind because it's important. And uh, <clears throat> this is what is exploited, for example, by, by, by machine learning. And uh, at the heart of, of machine learning, of many applications of machine learning, there's what is known in the field, uh, in jargon uh, to some extent, as the manifold uh, hypothesis. So the idea is that uh, um, uh, in order to describe some natural or human uh, phenomena, uh, there is of, it is often the case that this exponential complexity uh, is only, in a sense, apparent. Okay? So I, in that sense, I tricked you into thinking that to describe the wave function of n electrons, I would need the entire universe. It's not the case, because maybe we are able to simplify the problem. So look, think about a very simple problem now that has nothing to do, again, with quantum mechanics. But imagine that I have a planet, so this black dot here, orbiting around uh, its sun. So in principle, um, uh, if I knew nothing about the, the problem, uh, in order to describe the motion of this system, I would need two coordinates, x and y, at all times. So I will need two numbers, x and y, to describe the position of this particle or this planet for all times, right? However, we know, I mean, for, from observations, for example, that uh, we do not really need these two numbers, x and y, but we are, uh, you know, we are good with only one number, phi, which is the angle formed by the planet and this vertical line. Why? Because uh, we see and, uh, that uh, essentially the, the planet is not performing a chaotic motion in this plane, so it's not just going uh, uh, everywhere it likes, but it's orbiting a very regular and natural, in this sense, orbit around its planet. So we only need to know, if you want, what is the angle that is formed to describe uh, the position of this, uh, of this planet at all times. And this is a very simple and uh, you know, maybe simplistic view on the manifold hypothesis, but the idea is that in this case, we can reduce, if you want, the complexity of the problem from two coordinates, so two numbers, to only one, because there's some regularity in the motion of, of the problem. And this manifold hypothesis is at the heart of uh, learning machines, so essentially many applications that are done in, uh, in machine learning, where, uh, for example, if you are given a sequence of observation of your planet at different times, uh, it, this could be either obs actual observations or uh, simulations of the motion of your planet, then the idea of many of these uh, uh, machine learning approaches is that you can find a low-dimensional representation of the motion. So in other words, you can compress these three coordinates, x, y, and t, so positions uh, uh, and time, into a lower dimensional representation uh, theta that depends maybe on, on fewer parameters than the original, uh, if you want, the naive view on, on the problem. So this is at the heart of many uh, successful machine learning uh, approaches. And it's, uh, you know, the, the key, if you want, uh, ingredient that has allowed us to have, uh, to live, if you want, a golden decade of machine learning and the ongoing golden decade of machine learning. Uh, starting from uh, the early to 2010s uh, to nowadays, uh, we've seen really an explosion of this kind of machine learning based approaches that are able to capture, if you want, the essence of lower dimensional representations of uh, uh, language. So, for example, you've seen that starting from 2016 already, um, we've seen a huge progress in the ability of uh, uh, machines to translate sentences. That's because they are able, in a sense, to capture the low dimensional representation of language. So in a sense, to understand uh, how correlations among different words appear, and also, to some extent, how grammar works in these, uh, in these languages. And these days, I mean, uh, already in 2016, actually, uh, Google DeepMind devised the, the first artificial intelligence based on these, uh, in a sense, these lower dimensional representations that was able to beat 
for the first time uh, the, the, the champion of Go. There is also a nice documentary on Netflix that I, I advise you to, to watch, which is quite dramatic because it tells you about um, this, uh, this experience in, uh, essentially as it happened. It's, it's very nice. But uh, this is to say that uh, we've seen really strong progress in the field driven by um, this uh, learning, these lower dimensional representations of many interesting and complicated problems. And, uh, you know, recent breakthrough that we've seen and uh, I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with uh, are in uh, image generation and uh, also chatbots. Uh, uh, for example, in image generation, you know that uh, nowadays you can go uh, on, uh, on this website, uh, uh, for example, the DALI website of OpenAI, and you can write a prompt. So here I asked uh, a photo of uh, uh, a Schrodinger's cat uh, rescuing quantum mechanics in the style of Henri Cartier-Bresson. I mean, don't ask me why, but maybe I like Henri Cartier-Bresson. And you can see that uh, it's amazing what it comes up with. So you can see a cat at the blackboard trying to write down the equations of quantum gravity, maybe, that are rescuing you know, quantum mechanics in, the, in this set. Just you know, uh, unthinkable until uh, maybe a couple of years ago, or one year ago only. And the most important breakthrough we've seen these days is chat GPT, so I couldn't write, I couldn't uh, spare myself from writing a, a slide on chat GPT. Um, and uh, so the, 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 the many most important question that I want to ask GPT, if it is able to understand and solve for me uh, these many particles, these many electrons, quantum mechanics, uh, and solve all of our problems essentially. So that's what I did. I asked what is the, the ground state energy, so the energy that my atoms will have when they will be at lower temperatures, so at equilibrium essentially, uh, of, I don't know, 40 electrons, so this is somehow random, in a cubic lattice of a cubic box of uh, one uh, angstrom. Okay. So essentially, I, I imagine that I put my electrons in here and I ask this uh, fantastic tool if it can give me the solution. But unfortunately, and uh, this is, uh, uh, as you can expect, the, the outcome, it, it is going to tell me that this is a very complex task. So it cannot, <laughs> <laughs> cannot, comp cannot give me any answer at this point. But still, uh, which is, I find uh, somehow impressive, it will go through the, the, an approximate theory developed by Thomas and Fermi in the, you know, at the beginning, I mean, in the, in the middle of, uh, of the past century. And it will, it will give us at least an approximate answer, which is actually not too bad. So um, this, is, uh, this is the beginnings of something interesting, I believe. But still, the problem of finding and solving uh, in its uh, um, uh, you know, fullness, the, the, the Schrodinger's equation uh, and predicting the properties of these electronic systems is still very hard, even for this uh, advanced intelligence. So what are we going to do about that? Well, there are many ways to try to combine uh, uh, this, uh, this, um, uh, the, the beauty, if you want, of machine learning approaches with quantum mechanics. So today I will give you my own uh, version of that. This is what we call uh, neural uh, quantum states. So what are uh, neural quantum states? Well, uh, um, the, the main idea, if you want, the main motivation uh, is essentially the same that we have in, uh, for, uh, um, for this manifold hypothesis that I was telling you about in, uh, in, uh, in statistical learning, uh, as we call it, or if you want, in, in machine learning. Uh, and the main idea is that we are not interested really in, uh, in, uh, in uh, tracking down the motion of uh, random particles uh, uh, in a two-dimensional plane, but we, we are interested in studying the motion of a planet of natural phenomena that are of interest for, for us. Uh, and in a sense, there is the same kind of notion also for quantum mechanics because we are not interested in describing uh, arbitrary quantum states that live in uh, what uh, mathematicians call an Hilbert space, but we are only interested in describing a, a smaller corner, so that's why this is called the corner hypothesis, an exponentially smaller corner of uh, quantum states that live uh, in uh, what we call uh, physical states. Okay? So these are not random uh, uh, amplitudes, uh, not random uh, uh, phenomena in a sense, but these are phenomena that obey the laws of nature. So these obey, for example, the time-dependent Schrodinger's equation that I wrote here, or the time-independent one. So these coefficients, C up, down, etc., these are not random. They obey an equation that is, not, that is given by nature, where H is what we call the Hamiltonian of the system and contains all the physical interactions that are relevant for my system. So can we try to then uh, grasp if you want this corner of interesting wave function, interesting uh, if you want uh, quantum amplitudes more efficiently. One uh, possibility to do that, this is what we call neural quantum states, is to try to represent these uh, complex, complicated wave functions or these complicated uh, um, amplitudes 
uh, with uh, uh, an artificial neural network. So artificial neural networks are, in an essence, uh, at the heart of most of the uh, you know, exciting developments in machine learning that we've seen in the past decade or so. Um, and, uh, for example, in this specific case, uh, and in their application to quantum mechanics, so what we propose to do is, uh, is very simple conceptually, is that instead of storing all these exponentially many amplitudes that I have if I want to describe my many electron system, I can instead uh, uh, devise a black box, that is uh, this uh, machine that you can see here, that takes as an input one specific configuration of my electrons and spits out my wave function amplitude. So for example, the square of this will give me the probability of observing a certain sequence of spins. So then you see that in a sense we are solving the, 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 uh, the storage problem because we are not really storing all these amplitudes. We are just querying a machine to give us the best amplitudes that it has computed for us at the moment. Uh, and then in practice, mathematically, if uh, some of you like to read math, uh, you can think of this, uh, of this machine as a simple, uh, for example, in the simplest case, as a composition of, of, of simple functions where we enter with a, with, a, with a sequence of uh, up or down, which is this z vector that I write here. We apply a linear transformation, so this is like a matrix, essentially. And then on each of these components, we apply a nonlinear transformation. And then we have a cascade of linear and nonlinear transformations. So this object is called a neural network because it somehow resembles what happens in our brain, where we have a, a sequence of both linear and nonlinear transformations happening uh, in our um, neural system. Um, now, uh, the interesting aspect of these kind of representations of the many-body wave function is that we can also use them as if they were experiments. So in other words, once I have uh, uh, set up my neural network representation for my quantum system, and this will depend on a lot of parameters, so for example, all the connections of the neurons, all the connections inside this neural network, this will be effectively my, my parameters then what I can do is that I can query for observations. So I can pretend that this neural network is an actual quantum system uh, that can fake quantum mechanics, and then can return, for example, observations of my quantum system. So for example, can, uh, can give me what are the positions of my spins at every time I query it for, 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 a, for a given observation. And it can be shown that you can use these observations, for example, also to estimate any property of the system. So not only, um, let's say, observing the spins and their positions, but you can also estimate, for example, what is the energy of the system, which is one of the fundamental properties that uh, we need uh, in physics and chemistry to estimate the behavior of, of matter at different scales. So we have, in practice, a description of our uh, system, uh, you know, stored, fully stored on a classical computer, and then we can query it uh, to estimate several of properties of, of interest. And now we can use uh, and we can play a nice game, uh, which is, if you want, the quantum version of, of Go. Uh, and it's essentially the game of beating Schrodinger in a sense. Um, so the idea is that uh, for a given set of parameters, so for a given set of connections in your neural network, you will estimate a given energy, E. But now what you can do is that you can try, and you can try to tune the parameters in your neural network in order to lower the energy of your system. And it can be shown that uh, uh, in, uh, for every value of the parameters that you have in your neural network, you will get an estimate of the energy that is actually higher than the exact one. So this is known as the variational principle in, uh, in quantum mechanics. So this means that by solving a, an optimization problem, so by trying to minimize the energy as a function of these parameters, you can get a better, a better uh, estimate of uh, your properties and of the energy of, of the quantum system that you are trying to, to study. So this is the game. So instead of trying to beat my opponent and uh, having the, 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 the largest, highest score possible uh, in, a, in, in a given game, instead here my game is to minimize the energy. Okay? So this is the analogy, if you want, also with what we've seen uh, before. Um, <clears throat> so there are many uh, interesting phases of matter that, uh, that can be described in terms of these neural networks. Uh, I will not go into much into the details, but I just wanted to mention that uh, some of the higher entangled states of matter that appear, for example, in uh, topological phases and other things, can be, uh, can be described exactly. This can be shown uh, theoretically, if you want, by, 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 it has been shown by many people, by using uh, uh, small, in the sense that these neural networks, 
in the sense that these neural networks will not scale exponentially again with, uh, with system size. Um, and uh, more generally, uh, there are nice uh, mathematical theorems, uh, for example, uh, a theorem due to Kolmogorov and Arnold, uh, and later developed by Sibenko, that tells you that if you make your uh, wave function, so if you make, sorry, your, your neural network large enough, so in the sense that you keep adding neurons to your, your brain, at some point, uh, you will get uh, uh, as accurate as you want, essentially, in describing an arbitrary uh, quantum system uh, if, you, if we look at the, at the version of this um, in terms of, of wave functions. So this is known as universal approximation theorems and tells you that by increasing the size of these neural networks, at some point, I will get um, to the solution that I want. Where in the worst case, however, this uh, uh, growing up of neural networks could be even exponential. In the, in the number of degrees of freedom. But we see in practice that in most applications, this is not the case. And then, I mean, as I was mentioning before, we can also describe volume low states. So these are uh, essentially uh, a jargon for highly entangled states. So system where uh, things that are far apart really talk to each other uh, and that are hard to describe uh, historically, for example, with tensor networks. So with this kind of, of uh, wave functions, you can instead typically also describe these uh, uh, some of these phases uh, more, more efficiently. Uh, and uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, for example, recently we've shown that uh, uh, math mathematically you can prove that uh, uh, this, uh, if you look at the space of interesting, if you want, quantum states, so remember this uh, uh, drawing that I made at the beginning, uh, you can cover uh, some part of it. We don't know exactly how big is the white region that we cannot cover, unfortunately. But at least we can connect to other representations that have been known in, uh, in, uh, in the field. So, for example, you can show that uh, uh, if, you have a, 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 so if you have a quantum system in one dimension, then uh, you can describe uh, the, the ground state of this uh, system uh, exactly uh, using uh, uh, a neural network that does not scale exponentially, again, with the number of, 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 of spins that you have in the system. So this is a result that we recently obtained. And then there are more technical connections for those of you who are interested to other uh, representation of quantum states uh, known as uh, tensor networks. And that these are those that I, that I was uh, um, telling you about at the, at the beginning. So let me give you maybe a, a quick uh, outlook of what kind of problems we can solve uh, and uh, uh, how far we can go in, uh, in, this, uh, in, uh, in our endeavors uh, in, uh, in understanding and predicting properties of complicated many-body systems. Um, and I will start again with, with spins because, I mean, that's, uh, that was my initial, uh, if you want, uh, um, uh, starting point. And you can think, for example, that if I have a crystal, so if I have a material, uh, your electrons, right, uh, to a first approximation will be frozen at the sites that correspond to your crystal. So a crystal is an, an ordered if you want collection of, uh, of atoms, of electrons, and you can think to a first uh, degree of approximation that uh, they are frozen at their sides. So they cannot move around. However, they still have these spin degrees of, degrees of freedom that characterize their, um, their physics, right? So if, for example, you can think that I have an electron here that I can measure whether it is up or down. Oh, so while this, uh, this problem is an approximation because we are neglecting the motion of, of electrons in this case, However, this is, these are uh, already very interesting. Uh, uh, there are many interesting phenomena that, that are given rise by these simplified models. So for example, uh, uh, magnetism and all properties that are related to, uh, to the appearance of magnetic behavior in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in matter. And to give you an example, uh, uh, one application that we did in this context uh, with many other people is to study what happens when you have the interplay of these magnetic interactions of, of uh, spins of, uh, of frozen in your lattice sites. Uh, and I have here, for example, a two-dimensional material where I imagine that I have my electrons, uh, my spins sitting on, uh, on the edges of this square lattice. Um, and you can describe these, uh, these, uh, the interactions among these spins with a minimal model known as the J1, J2 model. The, the name is not too important. Uh, and this model has uh, essentially interactions between the spin on, the, on this side and also the spin on the longest, uh, if you want, uh, diagonal of this square lattice. Now, why this is interesting? Because it has been speculated, but not uh, proven uh, uh, so far, um, that uh, these, uh, these kind of, uh, of, of, of systems that are relevant for, for many, some materials um, can exhibit uh, uh, what we call a spin-liquid phase. 
So a spin liquid phase uh, is a phase of matter where you don't have magnetic ordering. So you don't have, for example, that your spins are all pointing up or down in your lattice, as, for example, depicted here, where you see I have down, up, down, down, down. It is known as that order. Uh, or you don't have this other kind of uh, funny uh, you know, uh, ordering where you have, for example, columns of up and columns of down. But in this uh, intermediate regime, where this term here is uh, compatible with uh, J1 in this case, it has been speculated that there is a sort of disordered non-magnetic phase of matter that has been uh, uh, known and uh, uh, you know, it is known as spin liquid. Now, what can we do there? Well, uh, for example, I mean, just to show you the progress in the field, uh, we started by studying the, the, the ground state properties of, of this Hamiltonian, so the energy, for example, of this Hamiltonian, when you turn off this term, which is the one that is uh, nasty and uh, gives rise to what we call uh, uh, frustration in the system. Uh, and you can see that in this case, where we have exact benchmark energies, uh, the error that you make in uh, determining the, the ground state energy of this problem um, can be made uh, significantly uh, you know, small, uh, by essentially by improving the quality of your neural network. So these were the first results where we get around 10 to the minus 3 in accuracy on the energy. Then uh, this is uh, more recent results where we use the deeper network. Uh, and then a more even more recent uh, around 10 to the minus 5. And then uh, just to show you the progress in the field, uh, two weeks ago, and I didn't have time to put it in the plot, there's been another paper where increasing further the depth essentially of these neural networks gets around here, so 10 to the minus 7 or so, so it's out uh, of scale in this, uh, in this slide. I would have needed uh, a different format for the slide. So we've seen a tremendous progress in the past uh, five or six years in the ability to approximate with higher accuracy also the energies of these uh, strongly correlated quantum systems. And just to give you an idea now, uh, if we move from this point uh, where J2, so this uh, frustrated interaction is zero, and we go to something where J2 is finite, uh, we were able uh, already in 2019 to show that this kind of approaches based on neural networks can improve on uh, leading methods, for example, uh, on uh, these tensor networks, um, essentially in all the, the, the regimes that, that are relevant. But there were a few points here. So you see that if these points lay here, means that our approach, so these neural network approaches are worse in accuracy. So there were still a couple of points where we couldn't improve on these, uh, um, on these existing, if you want, state-of-the-art methods. But the situation, um, as you can imagine, in uh, three years or so has changed dramatically. Um, and already, actually, in 2021, there's been uh, uh, a very nice work uh, from uh, this Japanese group where they showed that by improving, essentially, these neural networks further, you can uh, uh, improve all the energies that were available uh, and uh, state-of-the-art methods could, could obtain on this system. So for example, this is the result obtained with the neural network. These were the others. And you see that the lowest energy uh, gives you the highest score, right? So as I was telling you before, the game here is to lower the energy as much as possible compatibly with the rules of quantum mechanics. And you see that um, this trend is something that we, we are seeing uh, in many other fields uh, where we, we really see that uh, this kind of approaches based on machine learning can improve on uh, existing uh, methods. So for example, in this specific case, they were able to identify precisely uh, the existence of this putative spin liquid phase. So they found, uh, if you want, uh, what values you have to tune your material at to have this spin liquid phase. And also they found the existence of a new phase uh, or that was speculated um, that is called the valence bond solid. I will not go and enter too much into the details, but they found a sort of surprise, if you want, in this uh, phase diagram. Now, uh, in the last, uh, uh, I guess, uh, um, five minutes or so, uh, I will tell you uh, something about uh, going uh, be beyond, if you want, uh, uh, this simple model of spins. So I will uh, allow myself now to have my, uh, my electrons to be unfrozen and go around in space as they should do, right? So remember that now I was considering only the spin, so this internal degree of freedom of my electrons. Uh, but in general, as you know, in, in nature, uh, my electrons can move uh, relatively freely around, so they have other degrees of freedom that are not frozen. Um, and this is essentially the cartoon now, so they are not frozen at lattice positions as I was doing before. And this is even more computational challenging uh, and uh, uh, you know, demanding from, uh, from the point of view of computational resources. Um, so in this case, there have been uh, many approaches uh, to studying uh, uh, fermions uh, as we call them. So electrons, for example, are a class of particles that are known as fermions. 
Um, and why uh, this is more complicated? Because when you have these uh, fermions, so for example electrons, um, you, you have to make sure that uh, the amplitude, so the wave function that describes the, this, uh, this system, obeys uh, to this uh, antisymmetric uh, condition that was given by, by, by Pauli, essentially. Um, and the idea is that, uh, um, for example, when you exchange two particles, so for example, particle one and particle two, then your amplitudes should, uh, should acquire a minus sign. Okay? So this is a fundamental property of, of nature that tells us that um, <clears throat> the functions that describe uh, these, uh, these, these electrons, for example, must be antisymmetric. However, there are many possibilities to, to enforce this, uh, this requirement. Uh, <clears throat> so there is, a, there is a way that is based on, um, uh, <clears throat> sorry, on what we call neural backflow, uh, and it's an approach that was developed uh, by, by a group in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the US. Uh, so I will not go into the details of this, of this approximation, so in these approaches, but the main idea is to be able to represent these amplitudes that, that in a way that they obey to this, uh, <clears throat> to this antisymmetric constraint that comes from the, from the wave function. So one uh, possibility to do so is to, um, <clears throat> is to do like chemists do. So essentially work with uh, occupation numbers. So for those of you who are in the field, so instead of representing now uh, electrons in, uh, in free space, I can, uh, <clears throat> I can see where the electrons are in, uh, in, uh, in, my, in my orbitals. So if you think of uh, uh, a chemist-like uh, uh, image of, uh, of this problem. And just to give you an idea of this application, so we studied the, the behavior of, of, of molecules in uh, small molecules, uh, admittedly. Uh, when you, you, for example, you tear them apart, you can compute the energy uh, of this, uh, for example, this is um, a ca carbon dimer, so you have two carbon atoms, and you pull them apart, and you can see that uh, the energy will increase uh, if you pull them, uh, put, put them too, too close together, it will diverge, uh, and it will go to some constant, which is the so-called dissociation energy when you pull them apart. And in these simple small molecules, you can see that uh, one can get uh, very good accuracy. So our results are these uh, green lines, uh, green uh, dots, and uh, the red ones are essentially the exact solution that you can get uh, still on these small molecules. Now, uh, these approaches have been extended also to much larger systems. Uh, so for example, recently, uh, people have been able to study in uh, simplified models for more complex molecules, for example, uh, sodium carbonate, uh, and uh, in most cases, um, these approaches based on, neural net, based on neural networks are able to improve uh, significantly on uh, other um, approaches that chemists have been using, uh, uh, you know, consistently uh, to, to treat these, uh, these, uh, the interactions among electrons in these, in these systems. Let me also mention, since uh, we have one of the uh, main uh, uh, makers of this uh, in the audience, uh, uh, we have uh, we have, uh, um, sorry, so we have Frank Noe uh, in the audience. <clears throat> There's been an alternative approach that is based on uh, instead working directly in continuous space, uh, um, where we don't make this discretization, if you want, of, of the orbitals as is, as is done often in, in chemistry, but we directly work with uh, the positions of, of, of the electrons. And this alternative approach that is uh, described in this paper, uh, that is a review essentially of many works that have been done in the field so far, uh, is also um, is, uh, actually uh, in some sense more competitive than the one that I showed you before and can be used, for example, to study complex, uh, um, already complex, more complex phenomena. For example, this automatization of a cyclobutadine, uh, that is uh, the molecule that you can see here. And in most cases, that it has been shown that approaches based on neural network are really able to improve on uh, all the existing or most of the existing uh, uh, theoretical predictions that you could do with, uh, with uh, other more established uh, um, techniques, at least on these small, uh, relatively small uh, molecules. So since uh, I guess that now we are close to, uh, to, to the end and uh, my voice is really uh, killing me, so I will skip this part on uh, nuclear physics, unfortunately. Uh, but if you're interested, uh, I, will, I will tell you more about this later. I will just flash maybe this result because recently we've been able to study what happens in a, in a, in a, essentially in a neutral star. Uh, and we were able to study from first principles, so using uh, this neural network networks, uh, what happens in, uh, in, uh, essentially in, uh, in uh, this inner crust of, of neutron stars. And uh, we were able to show that there is a uh, uh, superfluidity of, of neutrons uh, using, again, this, uh, this kind of, of approaches. I will skip this part, unfortunately. But uh, you can see the reference and the collaboration that we did uh, with Argon in, his, in these references um, that you can see uh, written on, uh, on the slide. 
Okay, so um, as, you, as, I, as I try to convince you, uh, if we have a, a wave function representation that is based on neural networks, we can try to, to improve some of the existing methods uh, and we can try to uh, describe more accurately some of the hard problems that, uh, that have been uh, um, around in the, in the field for, for, many, for many decades. Uh, and uh, as I was, uh, I was telling you, we've seen a progression of um, more complex applications of these techniques. So for example, uh, starting from spins and then to moving electrons, then uh, the, the problem of studying uh, chemistry where you also have not only electrons, but you also have nuclei, which is uh, what I described before, in, uh, for example, in the previous slides. And then uh, the last part that I didn't have time to touch upon, it's where we focus instead only on the nuclei here and try to understand the structure also using the same kind of uh, wave function based uh, on, uh, on neural networks. And the beauty of these approaches is that by using essentially the same architecture, so using the same representations of quantum mechanics, you can go from scales that uh, are relevant for, for materials to scales that are relevant to stars without uh, changing too much, if you want, the architectures and the techniques that you use to study this uh, quantum system. So that's one of the things that I find the most exciting in this field, that you can quickly prototype and study new systems that are um, that would need, uh, with traditional methods, a lot more thoughts and a lot of more, um, you know, development in terms of uh, theoretical tools. Uh, and uh, I would like to, to maybe just uh, close with this slide, again with ChatGPT, uh, because I believe that in the future, maybe in the next uh, decade, not yet, uh, we'll be able to uh, likely integrate, as I hope, uh, this uh, uh, chat-based uh, systems uh, with uh, these more advanced uh, simulations uh, um, based on, on neural networks. So for example, one hope would be that you ask ChatGPT to perform for you a neural quantum state simulation of uh, your electrons in a box, and then ChatGPT at some point uh, will be able to connect to, to the technology or run it uh, in, in some more advanced way in the next decade, we will see, um, in, a, in a way that is consistent. However, if you try to do that now, uh, the chat GPT is a bit confused about uh, how to use neural networks and uh, to simulate quantum mechanics. Uh, if you can read through this, you will see that there is some sort of, of confusion. So this is not for today, but I believe that uh, in the next, uh, again, a decade or so, we will be able to combine uh, and have really virtual assistants that are able to, uh, to return and to compute properties of materials, of molecules, with an accuracy that is enough to estimate most of the of the uh, interesting uh, uh, problems and uh, interesting uh, material design questions that, uh, that, uh, that will appear uh, in, uh, in the future. So thank you.